Okay, it's going to be a review of King of the Ring 1995, arguably the worst pay-per-view in WWE history. Uh, without a doubt, the very worst uh, King of the Ring pay-per-view. Uh, only one, only going to review this because it would complete uh, the King of the Ring set. That's the only reason I'm reviewing it. But uh, yeah, I'm not a big fan uh, of this show. Uh, never want to watch it again. Uh, really, the, the thing that really brought it down was Mabel. I, I think Mabel really is the main reason why the show sucks. Um, that's really it. I, I mean, uh, the, 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 this has been labeled the worst pay-per-view of all time, but it's really just solely... Uh, the, the, the main event isn't great. You know, the, the main event easily could have been... Uh, I, I think if the main event was a regular house show match or a re regular television match, it wouldn't have been that criticized. But really, it's just, it, this is all about Mabel just sucking in the ring. I, and I think that kind of gets lost when you're discussing uh, the King of the Ring 1995. But uh, but yeah, man, let's get right down to it. I want to keep this short and sweet because it's really not worth, you know, spending a lot of time on. But, you know, I love the King of the Ring. I love pro wrestling tournaments. So let's just wrap this up from a completist um, standpoint. So we're going all the way back to June 25th. 1995, uh, from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the home of ECW. At the time, it was still called the Spectrum. Uh, they changed the name from Philadelphia Spectrum to the Core State Spectrum. Uh, pretty, pretty large gate here. You got 16,590 fans. Uh, not, not a bad atmosphere at all. I, I thought the crowd was actually really good here. Um, obviously, it's Philadelphia, and Philadelphia loves to crap on things, and they, they did crap on the finals with the ECW chants. So you saw a lot of familiar fans in the crowd. You saw the Straw Hat Dude, uh, which RVD actually talked about on the ECW documentary. And you, you also saw the dude with really long hair and the glasses. At this point, he is actually wearing just regular glasses, but eventually he would switch it to shades. That dude was at a lot of pay-per-views. I mean, almost like every big pay-per-view in the 90s and ECW he was at pretty much every single pay-per-view um, you could think of, or you know, even going back to the the early 2000s as well. So I'm sure some guys know who I'm talking about. But uh, yeah, uh, the pay-per-view buy rate here, we do 150, 150, which is actually lower than the in-your-house pay-per-views in between here. So so I, I think too, like what I've what I've noticed about this King of the Ring, I just don't think a lot of effort was put into it i think at the time i think vince was a little bit more focused on establishing in your house as a brand and it combined with the promotion of the in your house and the lower cost uh obviously those did a lot better you had diesel versus sid on both of the uh in your house shows and this just had a tag match so uh it it, it doesn't really surprise me that king of the ring got a lower buy rate than the than the may and july um in your house pay-per-views but but yeah man let's get right down to it okay so when you watch this on the network they actually have it wasn't the sunday night heat match but it was a sunday sunday night countdown match i forget the exact name of it and it was actually a qualifying match you had savio vega taking on the irs and crowd was great for that savio actually pins the irs with dibiase on the outside um in about five minutes. Uh, so at, at this time, Ted DiBiase is, is clearly uh, the top heel in the company as, as a manager. Um, and then we get to the main show. And you got Savio Vega coming out with Razor Ramon. So Razor had his ribs all taped up. So I, I, don't, I don't even want to, you know, dwell on it. But th this kind of leads me to be believe if Razor was healthy, maybe he would have gotten that spot uh, in the finals. But... I think it all worked out. I don't think Razor even wanted to. When you look back on it, you you kind of you kind of say to yourself, you know, thank God Razor didn't have to compete against Mabel in the finals there. So you got Savio actually taking on Yokozuna. Yoko's got Jim Cornette and Mr. Fuji out there with him. I thought this was good. This this the beginning of the show was actually the best part of the show. The the crowd was into uh, Savio here. There was actually USA chance for Savio Vega. Because of Jim Cornette pounding the mat, or a razor actually pounding the mat here. So, you know, Savio's from Puerto Rico, but, you know, you could argue that Puerto Rico is, you know, I, I believe it actually is a, 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 a one of the 52 states. So, um, 
ends ends in a count out, but it was actually not that bad for for the amount of time that it went. So Savio advances to the the next round. Next up, you got the roadie road dog Jesse James with Jeff Jarrett taking on Bob Holly. I thought the match actually flowed really well. Uh, the only the only bad part about it was the finish. So road dog goes over uh, Bob Holly, the race car driver at the time, but. You know, really, really nice flow. The, the the finish was just really, really uh, awkward, and and it almost felt like it was botched. So a, a lot of people would actually say that the the start of the show was actually the best part of the show. Uh, and next up, we got Kama with Ted DiBiase taking on Shawn Michaels. And um, all right, so let me talk about the Shawn Michaels promo. Really, really interesting stuff. So they 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 show a clip of Shawn uh, beating King Kong Bundy uh, to advance to the pay per view. And uh, who is it? Is it Todd Pangale? He actually says that was a hell of a match, Sean. And Sean's like, yeah, well, every match I'm in is a hell of a matchup. Kind of a cocky thing to say. But you, you, you get the point. Sean's trying to illustrate that he's a great worker. And he goes on a tirade about how that's what I'm trying to show everybody here. Being big doesn't necessarily make you good. And, man, that is a hell of a soundbite right there. And it really kind of ties into the finals there's this my I, I guess even back in 1995 there was this mindset that you know you had to be big you had to be large you had to be fat you had to have you know 300 pounds and almost seven feet tall to be a main eventer in the wwf there, there that was the mentality at the time and you got Shawn michaels on the undercard here i, I you know I, I don't think Shawn needed the win king of the ring here I, I really don't think he needed it you know he won the royal rumble he was in the title match at wrestlemania King Shawn Michaels, you know, this is the only time Shawn was in a King of the Ring uh, tournament, I believe. So it's pretty cool that he was in the tournament. But this match with Kama, I got to say, probably one of the more forgettable Shawn Michaels matches. I, I mean, the, the match wasn't bad. It went to a 15 minute time limit. You know, Michaels uh, bumped his ass off for Kama. You know, pretty much what you would expect. It's not like Shawn Michaels you know, didn't give effort here. He, the effort was really, really good. You know, after it went to a time limit, he gave Kama the super kick. Um, so the fans went home happy, but, you know, it's just, you know, you, you when you got Sean in a tournament like this at the time, I, I could just see how it could be a little bit deflating that you don't get a, a worker like Shawn Michaels to advance in, into the finals right here. But, you know, Kama, uh, you know, it's the same guy that plays the Godfather. I don't, I do not think he's a great worker. If, if you can't have a good match with Shawn Michaels, uh, then something's wrong. I, I would say the match was, was fairly good. You know, I, I wouldn't say it was great. You know, this is a Shawn Michaels match that I really don't uh, enjoy going back to, but you know, they went 15 minutes, you know, these are 15 minute time limits. So the match was what it was. So yeah, it ends in a time, it ends in a time limit draw. So um, that enables Mabel to go right to the finals. So he's going to get a bye. So so we got Mabel taking on the Undertaker, uh, which is is got to be up there with one of the worst ma matches Taker ever had. Uh, Mabel looked lethargic here, and God damn it, I I gotta say, you know, give the Undertaker a lot of courage, a lot of credit. For taking a pile driver from Mabel, you know I'm, I'm not sure why he took it. You know he probably had the fear for his life, but uh, everything was okay. But I, I just thought a lot of the offense here from Mabel just looked uh, excruciatingly painful to watch. I mean it just it ju it just was not good. So Kama actually interferes, um, and Mabel actually gets a leg drop on Taker to get the victory. So, yeah, you know, it it, it kind of surprised me. I, I always thought Undertaker, um, you know, either got counted out or disqualified. Uh, but it, it's really, really interesting that, that Mabel actually got a pinfall on The Undertaker. That just shows you how serious Vince was uh, about pushing Mabel. Uh, so there you go. One of the worst matches of all time. Uh, you know, easily uh, one of the worst matches The Undertaker would ever have. You know, Taker wasn't bad here. It's just, and, and, and you know, y you get the feeling like, you know, this opened the door up for a guy like Mick Foley to come in and get that massive push because, you know, Undertaker was just tired. He was tired of working with crap, tired of working with these guys that just sucked, whether it be John Gonzalez and, and Mabel. 
he worked with Mabel this whole year, I think. That that's how he ended up wearing that uh that Phantom of the Opera mask. So there we go. Ten minutes too long. Ten minutes and forty four seconds too long. Uh, but Mabel advances to the finals. He gets a free ride to the finals because Sean and and Kama uh, end in a time limit draw. Uh, all right, next up we got Savio taking on the roadie. You know, Savio is a good worker, man. I I, I really tried to get into this match. Uh, you know, he, he's he, his comeback was good. He's actually really really good. Uh, Savio, uh, I, I just think he needs to be in the ring with the right guy. The, the, there's a lot of times when if you just bring him out of the blue or just put him in the ring with the wrong guy, the, the matchup comes off very, very bland. Uh, so Savio does go over. Once again, I, I I tried to get into it. I just lost interest halfway through the match. There was actually a fight in the crowd. So I think that definitely hurt the match. And uh, after it was over, uh, Savio's cutting a promo in Spanish and uh, Doc Hendricks is actually trying to translate it and it did not go over very well v Vince lost patience and was just was just telling everybody just to cut the segment it just didn't go well but uh, you know Savio did show a lot of energy and a lot of passion you know he was you, you could clearly tell Savio was uh, motivated because he was going to be in the finals here but uh, yeah not a good performance from the roadie though once again the, the crowd just lost interest halfway through this thing it only went about six minutes six and a half minutes all right next up we got Bret Hart taking on Jerry the King Lawler uh, we're finally going to blow this off two years in the making so this is two years since the King of the Ring 1993 where Jerry Lawler um, you know attacked Bret Hart you know, because uh, you know Jerry's the real king and, and Bret Hart saw, started calling him the Burger King so that's where the Burger King chants started for uh, Jerry Lawler, which, you know, they, it's funny. They, they carried on for a while. They stopped doing it when, you know, Jerry and Jim, you know, started calling the pay-per-views by themselves. But um, the Brett and Jerry stuff, I, I like it. I, I think it's a good feud. You know, the, the feud really did live on for years. You know, when you go back to that highlight reel between Sean and, and Jericho from Montreal, uh, someone had a sign in the crowd that said, Bret Hart is God. And Jerry, Jerry just said, Bret Hart is God. Please, people. And then I, I think at the Hall of Fame, Bret was telling a story about Jerry Lawler. And the fans started booing because they remember the feud. So it's a, it's a very memorable feud. It, it almost feels like it's got a little bit of real life uh, tension to it. So this is actually a kiss my foot match. All right. So they had this uh, this girl. I forget her name. Her name was Stephanie. I forget how to pronounce the last name, but uh, she really came off like she was like a um, like a, a local news anchor. Um, almost sounded like a, like an elementary school teacher, and, and th that's kind of one of the problems here. I, when you're watching a pro wrestling pay per view, I, I don't think you want to feel like you're watching the local news or, or feel like you're in school. Uh, you know, I. I you know, some people might disagree with this, but I'd rather have someone like a Christy Hemme or a Jenna Jameson or, you know, uh, like someone that's more of like a stripper actually, um, you know, anchor the show or, or do do some of the interviews backstage like a diva search girl. I, I, I don't know. I, I just think the local news field, it just get, it just reeked of Vince just trying to appeal uh, to the sponsors. That's how it came off. But but I'll tell you what, though, Jerry, Jerry and this girl, Stephanie, had a really good um interaction you know because she was like what's that smell what's that smell and jerry law was like y you know what that smell is i think it's you i think it's you and she's like no it's not i yeah. so i thought it was a really really entertaining exchange between jerry and stephanie um you know obviously uh jerry wanted to stink up his foot so the foot would smell when bret hart had to kiss it so you have that going on but i'll tell you man this bret hart promo is fucking hilarious man it, it, it's got to be <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be one of the funniest promos ever because Brett, it just shows you how serious Brett took the business. Uh, he, he goes into this promo about how, you know, I, I hate to admit this, but, you know, I've actually been training hard for this match because I don't want to make any mistakes. You know, you know, I, I got to train for outside interference. So, <laughs> so it's like he, he's almost embarrassed to admit that he's been training hard to face Jerry the King Lawler because, you know, Jerry's a little bit out of shape. He's the Burger King. I, I get that. But, but, th but then he, he talks about how in some of the, one of the previous matches, 
you know, Jerry was able to get the upper hand. And, and just the way Brett says it, with the help of Hakushi, of course, it's like he just had to say it just to make sure everybody understood the only reason Jerry got, you know, I can't remember if it was a pinfall or an upper hand on him, but he said, with the help of Hakushi, of course. So uh, I've always thought that was hilarious, just, just the way Brett, how serious Brett took this promo. But uh, but yeah, man, I thought I thought Brett was great here. Th this 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 was definitely Brett Hart in his prime. Uh, the reaction was great. You know, Vin Vince was uh, euphoric over the reaction that Brett got. Um, Jerry actually dominated the match. He actually got a you know sequence of you know three pile drivers in a row. Uh, but Brett was able to come back and fight it off. I, I just, you know, Brett didn't do anything spectacular. He just kind of went into his routine, and I thought he just looked better than ever. I, and, and the reaction was great. He fought off the interference from Hakushi, and uh, he actually put uh, Jerry in the sharpshooter. Didn't want to relinquish it, but, you know, Earl, he ironically, Earl Hebner was uh, the one to, you know, get him to you know, relinquished the sharpshooter. And then, uh, you know, he made it, uh, Jerry kiss his foot. And then J Jerry spends the rest of the pay-per-view with the uh, toothpaste and the dental floss and, and tries to get the stench out of his uh, mouth. So it was a cute little match. I, I don't think the match is great or anything like that. I think Brett and Jerry, they're, they're, they have a reputation for being very skilled and very safe. You know, they know how to execute a pile driver or, you know, a big time move without hurting people. So, you know, they, they were able to display that. But it's not, you know, I, it's it's it, it, the, the feud is better than the matches, though. Well, let, let's just put it. Let's just put it like that. And then we we'll move on to the uh, disaster. That was the finals here. So we got Mabel with Mo. Uh, you know, Mo was like uh, Mabel's mouthpiece. And um, we saw the King of the Ring coronation with Mo kind of reading from a scripture. Uh, to make it a little bit more uh, royal. Uh, so you got Mabel taking on Savio Vega in the finals here. Uh, not a good final. I, I thought, you know, g give Savio Vega credit. You know, he had some nice moments of comebacks. He actually did clothesline Mabel over the top rope, which got a good ovation. He actually hit a spinning heel kick uh, on Mabel, which got a good reaction as well. So Savio did get some offense, and you almost kind of feel bad for him. But there, there's sequences in the match where Mabel has a a front face lock on Savio. And then there's another sequence where it, it looks like Mabel's trying to give him shoulder blocks. I don't know what the fuck he's trying to do. It's, it just looks like a big fat guy just trying to, you know, deliver um, a series of shoulder blocks. And he just had a tough time with it. And all of a sudden the fans just start going like ECW, ECW. And then the straw hat dude actually heard him. And, and then he started chanting them. And then the, it kind of trickled down to the front row with the ECW diehard fans, and it just it just came off great. You know, it, it was great exposure for ECW. Vince tried to ignore it. He's like, oh, quite frankly, I beg your pardon, Doc. Oh, I just went one, two, ah, oh, forgot about it, ah. So Vince really tried to ignore it. But, um, you know, I, it, it wasn't like they hijacked the show, though. Like, like it, it only lasted about 15 seconds. It wasn't like... The fans are chanting ECW throughout the whole match. You, you got 16,000 fans out there. There's probably only 1,000 that even knew what ECW was at the time. So you have that going on there. But uh, but yeah, um, Mabel's able to do a couple of, you know, you know, Savio kicked out of a couple of, you know, splashes. But ultimately, Mabel uh, put Savio away and, you know, a dreadful match. You know, one of the, you know, probably one of the worst matches of all time. Just the decision to have Mabel win this thing. And then you have the coronation with King Mo and uh, Mabel's actually has the, the robe, the crown, and he actually has a sword with him as well. And uh, after the match is over, Savio and um, Razor Ramon and one, two, three kid are, you know, trying to get the revenge on, on Mabel. So they're trying to make Mabel the, uh, the top level heel. Uh, obviously, you know, I I'm trying to think of Vince's mentality here. You got diesel as the champion at the time. So, the mindset is that you need a seven foot monster to go up against him. But uh I don't know, man. It's just he Mabel just did not look good. He just he just looks like an an oversized uh you know, seven foot, you know, fat, you know, black dude right here. And, and that's the other thing that gets lost here too. And I, I wanna give Vince credit, you know, because you know, I know WWE has had a reputation of um, you know, especially with the Booker T stuff, 
a lot of people kind of questioned, I think, at that time is, you know, may, maybe they're a little bit racist. But I, I don't think Vince is 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 racist at all. Like, I, I think he he was always willing to give. And he's a big fan of, of Rocky, obviously. You know, the, the WrestleMania 1 uh, main event was definitely inspired by Rocky. You put Mr. T in the, the first ever WrestleMania main event. I mean, and then once again, you're, you know, they didn't give Mabel the belt here, but they're clearly giving an opportunity uh, to a young black male here. And, um, you know, it wasn't really Vince that, you know, put the axe to Mabel getting the title shot. It was the fans and it was just kind of, you know, just the, the nature of the business. So Vince has always really been willing to give, uh, you know, black wrestlers a, a, a shot. It, it's it's just, I just think a lot of the guys that he decided to push, they just weren't able uh, to take that next step, whether it be Mabel, whether it be Farouk, whether it be uh, Ahmed Johnson, you know, there was always an injury or, or just a, a, a lack of, uh, a lack of, um, you know, connection with the fans, uh, so to say. So, uh, but yeah, you know, Mabel, uh, you're king of the ring. You know, the, 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 pe people don't bitch about this because Mabel was black. They they bitch about it because he just wasn't good. You know, he he he, he wasn't. He clearly was not ready for it. Um, it was it was almost a joke of a match. Like he just, you know, he just probably just needed a lot more training. That's just the bottom line. Um, you know, conditioning is a huge part of wrestling, and the 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 con conditioning and mobility uh, was just not there, and it, it it just looked bad. It looked really really bad. It's it's as it's as simple as that. Uh, and next up, we have the main event. We got Bam Bam Bigelow, uh, the newly turned babyface, as, as DiBiase was disappointed that he couldn't get the job done at WrestleMania 11, and he's teaming up with uh, Big Daddy Cool Diesel uh, to take on Psycho Sid and Tatanka. Uh, so Diesel's was coming off of uh, elbow surgery uh, at the first in your house. Sid gave him a power bomb and uh, he landed on his elbow. So he had his elbow all uh, operated on and, and, and bandaged up. Uh, very similar to Triple H at King of the Ring 2002. Uh, I believe he, he fractured a, uh, you know, so, some bones in his elbow from an Undertaker chair shot. So not the first time we've seen an elbow uh, um, uh, injury at the King of the Ring. So... Um, I you know I, I I do not think this is a bad uh, main event. Um, you know if this was a like I said man if this is a television taping if this is a house show I, I think the main event would have been fine. Uh, the, the the problem is uh, the main event of uh, one of the big five pay per views of the year. Uh, it just didn't feel like it was anything special. Sid actually walks out uh, during the match. Um, you know they they want to build to the in your house stuff with diesel and sid so you, you definitely understand that so it, it really is the definition of filler uh there you know bam bam bigelow did not look good here vince had him kind of dress up um with this fire attire and uh it, it looked a little bit corny um you know this was not the kevin nash uh from wcw this was not the diesel from 1996 uh it was very watered down here very uncomfortable and just just the way diesel dragged the belt like, did anyone notice that when, when Diesel came down to the ring, he would always drag the championship belt like it was a piece of shit. But um, I don't know if he was trying to send the message to Vince that he wasn't happy, but you had that going on there. But, hey, you know, it's not a bad mix of talent. It's really not. Bam Bam is a good worker. Tatanka is a good worker. Sid is the moneymaker. Diesel's the champion. It's it's really not a bad mix of talent. Um I, I just felt like the match was a little bit watered down. Uh, you know, they were going to work on, on Diesel's elbow. Uh, that wasn't bad. Bam Bam looked okay. Um, you know, I thought Tatanka looked good. You know, halfway, dur halfway during the match, Sid just walked out. And, uh, you know, that, that enabled Diesel to get the uh, finish on Tatanka with an elbow drop. There was a lot of teasing from Diesel that he could have won the match anytime he wanted. So you have you have that going on there. But... Yeah, just a pretty uh, lackluster main event. I'm not going to say it was awful, and it's not the reason this show sucks. Um, but, you know, a, a tag a tag match like this between Bam Bam and Diesel, it just felt very, very fake. Um, I think the other thing is there's rumors that, uh, you know, the click kind of put an end to the Bam Bam Bigelow push. I, I, just, don't, I just don't know if Bam Bam would have really worked as a babyface at that time. Uh, you know, I, I think it was probably a mistake to turn him heel. I think if anything... I think Bam Bam probably should have got the spot against Nash, you know, going in the SummerSlam. 
I, I think that would have been the much better option. But, you know, if you want to find the silver lining for this King of the Ring, I think the the winner of the King of the Ring going on to SummerSlam and getting the title shot, I really like that about it. And I wish they would, would have done that a little bit more often uh, with the King of the Ring. But, hey, man, uh, that's pretty much it. That's King of the Ring 1995. By me crapping on this show and reviewing it, it probably doesn't help um, you know, the cause for bringing King of the Ring back. Obviously, they had the thought of bringing it back this year with the King of the Ring and the Queen of the Ring on one pay-per-view. You know, Saudi Arabia, you know, you really need to sell tickets. So how how are you supposed to sell tickets by, you know, doing a tournament, you know, not having any stars? So I, I totally get the reason why they had to rebrand it. You know, you can't have Roman, Cody, and uh, Brock Lesnar in the King of the Ring tournament. So I, I think it was a good move to rebrand it to Night of Champions. I, I, you know, it, you don't have to bring, and I've st- I said this before, but I don't think you really need um, to have a queen of the ring and a king of the ring on the same pay-per-view. If you want to, if you really want to do it for the women, you know, maybe have it on Raw. Maybe call it Raw Ladies Night, the, the queen of the ring. But uh, to do a king of the ring and a queen queen of the ring on the same pay-per-view, it's, it's a recipe for disaster. Uh, king of the ring has a great legacy. You know, you could just do it with all males on the pay-per-view. You could have the women, you know, have their own show on a WWE Network exclusive. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm just, I've said it time and time again. Anytime they do a, a women's Royal Rumble, a women's Money in the Bank, if, if you do a women's tournament, you know, which, you know, I think the tournament would actually be good for some women, you know, especially someone like The Rock's daughter that's trying to make a name for himself. I think years down the road, that would be perfect for someone like her. But you know, to do it on the same exact show, uh, it, it's it's like I said, it, I think it's a recipe for disaster. But um, yeah, it'd be, it'd be cool to have them bring back the King of the Ring uh, in a tournament, you know, on pay-per-view. It, it will be really, really cool. Uh, you, you almost get the feeling right now that you just you don't know if it's going to happen. And I, I, I think I think, you know, a lot of a lot of fans, they, they want to have a storyline. They want to have. Uh, a backstory going into to matches. I think sometimes with tournaments, and especially with Battle of Los Angeles too, like I think there are times when people people do look at the shows, and sometimes it just feels like just reading off matches or just looking at matches without any story. And sometimes I just think that scares people. You know that that might have a reason to do with why uh, they're a little bit hesitant to bring them back. But um, but hey, man, when you look at the positive side, King of the Ring did a lot. Uh, for a lot of guys, whether it be Owen Hart, Bret Hart, you know, Stone Cold, Triple H, uh, Kurt Angle, it, it, it's a huge catapult. It's more than just wrestling. Sometimes it helps helps you with character development. And with with this King of the Ring right here, this this was strictly about just creating a heel and giving him a king gimmick and hoping for the best. But obviously, it flopped and uh, it definitely backfired. The the silver lining in this thing was a gay. It, 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 it made Vince aware of ECW and it opened the door up for Vince to do business with ECW in 1996 and 1997 and the rest is history. So that's King of the Ring 1995. I'm sorry I spent too much time on it, but um, here it is. King of the Ring 1995 and I'm out. All right.